Hi, my name is Marty Otanias. Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. Uh, today we have a guest, Daniela Vergara, a postdoc at UC Boulder or CU Boulder. Um, and also you are a president of a nonprofit, a foundation. So on today's show, we're gonna talk about some of your work. You're an evolutionary biologist and you study the cannabis genome. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Marty. Thank you for having me here. So let's make sure I got it right. So explain your title. I know you have a couple different titles. So explain the work you do as a postdoc. So I am a researcher at CU Boulder. And what I do is um, I study the genome, which is the genetic makeup of cannabis plants. So the DNA and the letters in the DNA of these cannabis plants. And so, for people who are new to this kind of area of research, why is it important? Like, like why, what's the practical use either for the cannabis sector or for other researchers? So um, understanding the genome and the DNA is very important because that tells you what genes are related to physical to phenotypic traits. So for example, what are the genes related to eye color? So in this case, it's Genes are related, for example, to cannabinoid production, THC or CBD. And as we know, these compounds that the plant produces can be very important for medicine. So we're understanding in the DNA what makes, you, what makes a plant have more THC or more CBD um, through the genes and whether or not you, know, you can, you can uh, have offspring from parents that have high THC, whether those offspring are also going to have high THC. Right, whether those traits are inherited from parents to offspring. And some of the work you've done, you've published. So um, you have a number of different academic manuscripts. Mm -hmm. So tell us about one, like your favorite one. Uh, what did you do and what were some of your findings? So my favorite one. Um, so I, there's, there's several ones. There's one that was recently published that I co-authored and it was with um, now a uh, um, student in, in Austria and we looked at the, at the junk DNA and the, the repetitive content of the genome um, and we compared that to hops. So hops is the closest related species to cannabis. They're, they're very closely related and we looked at the repetitive content and so, so it's very interesting to see how, how, what type of junk DNA you find in the genome, which is, which is a lot. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty substantial fraction of the genome, which is it's junk. So that's one of the papers that was actually published this year or, or, la or late last year. And then there was another publication um, in collaboration with other researchers at CU Boulder and with Steep Hill, which is a company, a testing company based in California. And we looked at the different chemotypes, so at the different cannabinoid levels from the cannabis that was produced by the federal government and the cannabis that is produced by the um, legal markets. And we found that the one produced by the federal government has very low variation in cannabinoids. And also um, it has very, um, it has low variation and the potency of the, of the strains is, is low compared okay. to the federal, to the legal markets. Okay, so just to back up a bit. So the federal government is involved in cultivating cannabis and researchers are required to use that cannabis. Yes. And what you have yes. found is there's That's a problem important. with the cannabis. So explain that a little bit further. And if I got it right, it's the University of Mississippi? Yes, so the University of Mississippi has a contract with the federal government, with the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA. Um, and they are the ones that produce the cannabis that researchers are supposed to use in their research. So they produce the cannabis, but in order for you as a researcher to get a hold of the cannabis, you have to have a bunch of different licenses, a DEA, a DEA license, an FDA license, etc. And then you get a hold of that cannabis that you have to keep under very strict conditions. And, and you can study that cannabis. However, the cannabis that they produce does, is not comparable to the one from the legal markets. So it's not really comparable from the ones that people are actually using, the ones that you can you know, buy here in the streets in, in Denver if you're over 21. 
So, so we did, you know, it was mostly statistics comparing that cannabis produced by the federal government and the cannabis produced in the legal markets. And we found that they're, that they're not comparable. And explain a little bit more in what ways are they not comparable? Like, it seems, oh, it's convenient if I'm a researcher, I uh, get the cannabis from Mississippi, I have everything given to me and I'm, I'm good to go with some great results that can be generalizable. So what's, unpack a bit what's not comparable and then why overall is this important for research in the cannabis sector? So it is not comparable because the variety of cannabinoids is limited in the, the federal cannabis. So it is not as varied and also because the potency is much lower. So it is not as potent and it is not as varied. And that is problematic because then you're not really um, exploring what's out there, what people are actually using. So your results are going to be limited because you cannot extrapolate to what people are actually consuming. So this to me is pretty interesting because if I was a scientist and for a few years have used the cannabis from the federal government, from the University of Mississippi, and I've written up things, you're suggesting that the findings are potentially problematic? Yeah, maybe those findings are not accurate, right? Maybe, yeah. Okay, and so have you had conversations with people at the University of Mississippi or the federal government to suggest to them that they could do a better job in getting weed cultivated as comparable? No, I haven't had those conversations. I don't want to go there. Okay. <laughs> I, I, this is the research. I did the stats, um, wrote the paper, but I... <laughs> Uh, okay, no problem. I just think uh, <laughs> telescoping forward the kinds of um, practical things that could happen out of your findings. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. I think that definitely that's a place that, that we should go. I did have a conversation with this woman from the National Institute of, on Drug Abuse. She, she gave a presentation at a conference where, where I was, where, where you were at, at Pueblo. Okay. And, she, um, and I asked her, you know, like, okay, your, your, your cannabis is not representative. Um, but I think that there is a bunch of things involved and there's the DEA and all of these other organizations. And, you know, I, I don't think that it was up to her. Maybe she went and, and said, like, hey, I got all of these people saying, but I don't know. I mean, uh, until we are able to actually get the cannabis that people are using, I don't think that we're going to be able to, to improve right the, the research and, and especially the, the medical research mm -hmm. because because really people do not go for the government to buy weed like i i so far once at a conference i asked is there anyone that uses the governmental weed and there was a person over there that raised their hand and i was like please contact me and they didn't so i really do not know personally anyone that uses the, the governmental weed for okay. medicine or <clears throat> recreation. So you're raising some really interesting problems that I'm sure some researchers have overcome. So if I'm a professor at Boulder or I'm actually a professor at UC Denver and I wanna study uh, people who consume cannabis and the effects on the respiratory system, maybe because of mold. So what would I do to have a higher standard of the actual product by not going to University of Mississippi? Where would I go, how would I do that considering the IRB issues like is there any thoughts about that? legally legally oh no you can't you have to go to the University of Mississippi there is no other way right because if you because all of these universities um, they follow federal laws so if you bring cannabis on campus and I don't know what the legal counsel at, at, at um, Colorado in Denver what 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 have they said to you but but we for example for me i cannot bring cannabis on campus i cannot um if i bring cannabis on campus it has to be hemp and it has to go through the department of ag here in colorado hemp is whatever has less than 0 0.3 percent thc so so i cannot and and then studies on on mice models for example or on people cannot be done on campus so, so this is really interesting because I know at UC at CU Boulder there is a 
a van, I guess the can of van. Yeah. So then is that a creative solution to this problem or are they using weed from uh, the University of Mississippi? They are not. So, um, and the main researcher, Cinnamon Bidwell, she is actually, um, we, we co-authored this, this NIDA study. So, um, so Cinnamon has this, this brilliant idea of having a, a van and, and then the person, so they're studying how cannabinoids, how the intake of cannabinoids differ from person to person. So then they, ta they, they take a, a blood sample before using cannabis and then after you use it after a certain amount and they see how, how, it be, how much, I don't know, cannabinoid levels you have in your blood. But since they cannot do it on campus, then they have a van. And so they, they have someone, a, a nurse that knows how to take blood and et cetera, and then someone that's a volunteer and they know the particular strains and they are working with particular dispensaries. So they, they have this, this protocol so that they don't bring anything related to cannabis on campus. Okay, so yeah, it's an example of an innovative uh, problem solving <laughs> to this problem of the University yeah. of Mississippi weed. So why don't we take a break right now and I want to get back to uh, the work you do in the lab and some of the uh, ongoing work. So just to remind you, you're watching Getting High on Anthropology. I'm Marty Otanias, the producer and host, and with us today is Daniela Vergara, a, a researcher at CU Boulder. Uh, we're going to take a break and uh, we'll be right back. The history of cannabis is long and compelling. Carl Sagan suggested that cannabis may have been the world's first agricultural crop, leading to the development of civilization itself. And whether this idea is right or not, the usefulness of the plant is beyond question. In addition to marijuana's numerous medicinal uses, hemp, the non-psychoactive type of cannabis, can be used effectively in thousands of applications. Hemp seeds are an excellent source of protein, and hemp fiber is tremendously useful in textiles, biofuels, building materials, and cellulose for non-oil-based plastics. Many people aren't aware the Declaration of Independence was drafted on hemp paper. Hemp grows well in most climates and soil types around the globe. Additionally, it produces a high yield per unit area, up to four times more than the trees we currently use for paper. This is a plant that could potentially change the world as we know it. Modern advances in genetics and DNA sequencing technology allow for the first time to effectively study this super crop and unravel its unique genome. It has now become possible to improve seed lines and help farmers maximize yields for different goals. Breeding efficiency can also be greatly improved by a process called QTL mapping which reveals the regions of chromosomes that contain genes with substantial effects on any plant traits we want to measure. Based in Boulder, Colorado, the Agricultural Genomics Foundation is a nonprofit which aims to achieve these goals. AGF researchers have recently published the first complete DNA sequence of cannabis chloroplasts and mitochondria, and are currently working on genes related to cannabis's medical properties to produce hemp that could be used in medicine in the future but they need your help. Because marijuana is listed as a Schedule I substance according to the U.S. government, funding for cannabis research is nearly impossible to obtain, even for non-psychoactive hemp. As of 2017, this project is entirely supported by the general public. You can be a part of this momentous research. Support AGF today.
It's been four years since I moved from Cincinnati to Denver. My homie Kate is back in Ohio. We still talk on a regular basis and reminisce about our high school days. Each time I visit Ohio, it seems as though nothing has changed with her and I. When I arrive at the airport, she's the one who picks me up in her dirty old blue pickup truck. I instantly feel a sense of nostalgia as I sit in the front seat. The stench of freshly sweaty yoga clothes thrown in the back is hard to ignore as I close my eyes and smile to myself. Without hesitation, Kate lights up a joint and hands it to me. Moments later, we arrive to her apartment and I collapse on the couch. I feel at ease. Her presence tends to do that to me. This is home. Kate has been my best friend since we were 16. We were the rebels of our all-girls Catholic high school. So, of course, we were each other's smoking buddies. During lunch break at school, we would escape down the street where my car was parked and take a couple hits of my bowl. These occasions helped Kate and I to unwind from the demands of society. We would speak on the concepts of quantum physics and dwell on the possibilities that the future would hold. Our unruly style clearly stood out from the hundreds of girls around us who wore Bear Bradley and North Face brands every day. Kate's bedroom in her mom's house was an escape for me. I was able to delve into a world that I had not previously known. Since I was a little girl, I was taught by my mother and Catholic school teachers that I needed to be someone that I felt was unattainable. I discovered cannabis, which eased the anxieties and demands indoctrinated into my life. I spent my summers at Kate's house in her eclectic room with incense smoking, chill, etheric music in the distance, and a joint in my hand. Kate and I painted pictures, played the piano, and created rhythms with the bongos. We climbed on the roof which overlooked Montana Avenue. We would make beautiful meals for ourselves and carry on conversation that permitted me to independently make decisions and generate more acceptance and alternative views of cannabis in particular. Kate's mom and her stepdad, John, were always downstairs smoking their own weed and would often share amongst us. In that house, there were no expectations and no judgments. It became clear to me that people around me were uniquely human and I started to understand what authenticity truly meant. To me, marijuana is a driving force that changed my perception of the community around me. I consumed cannabis because it gave me a different perspective on how my life could be lived. With newfound insights into human coexistence, I felt a harmonizing sense of belonging. Cannabis made me feel a part of something bigger. I was liberated. Hi, welcome back to Getting High on Anthropology. We're going to continue our discussion with Daniela Vergara. She's a researcher, a researcher at CU Boulder. So Daniela, as a researcher, you're an evolutionary biologist. What would an ordinary day be like in your lab? Like take us through, like, do you have all this like fancy equipment and are you looking under a microscope all day? So what would be like the steps you take to then get to the publications? Um, so, okay, most of what I do is I analyze data. So I really just work with a computer and um, genomes are really big. So by definition, genomes are big data. And if we have you know, hundreds of genomes, that's a, a, a lot of data. So each, each genome in cannabis has around 800, 830 million base pairs, so letters. So they're pretty big. So to analyze all of that, you really need a computer with a lot of power, so a server. So it is not that interesting, you know, I'm not looking at microscopes, you know, we do the, we do the DNA extraction, so we extract the DNA from, from a leaf, from a cannabis leaf, but once you do that DNA extraction and you send it to sequencing to a third party, uh, um, an, another company, and then you get all of that data through a computer, so bioinformatic data. So most of what I do is just basically work on a computer and generate graphs and then write. <laughs> I, I, as a professor, I know that's a big yeah. part of what we do. Yeah. So what would be, um, with some of your current work, what are you like working on right now that's getting you kind of excited about the, the research you do? What am I working on right now? So I am very excited about the Y chromosome in cannabis. So cannabis has 
different sexes, so it has males and females and hermaphrodites that interbreed, right? So they can all have babies, males and females, or females and hermaphrodites, or hermaphrodites and males. And the males have a Y chromosome like us, right? Like males in, in, in humans also have a Y chromosome. So, so I would like to put the Y chromosome together. So kind of assemble the puzzle. So it's actually called as an assembly, right? So piece the puzzle of the Y chromosome and see what's there. I'm interested in, in looking at, at what's in the Y chromosome. And I think that maybe that's where I'm gonna go in the near future. Well, that's great. I hope you're willing to come back and talk about some of the findings. So I've seen you present a couple times. And I just love the work you're doing because it's um, uh, you know, filling a gap in terms of the research in general. So I've heard you talk about hemp. So just for people, could you just explain a little bit about the relationship with hemp and then how it um, is situated within cannabis generally? Because hemp is different than the THC kind of um, cannabis we consume. Yeah. So just anything interesting about hemp and uh, related to your findings in, in the genome related research? So hemp, so it, the cannabis genus, it's, 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 a, it's a genus, um, and within that genus, it depends on, on who you ask, but right now, in biology, there's only one species, and it's cannabis sativa, and um, there are different groups within cannabis sativa, and it appears that it's a very, very diverse genus, that there's a lot of of genetic diversity, so the letters in the DNA, they're very different from individual to individual. And hemp is one of the groupings within that genus. So hemp, it's usually used for um, industrial purposes like the fiber for clothing or, or for rope or the seeds for oil. Construction or material. Construction, yeah, etc. So it's not used for the, the, the compounds that it produces. You, you do not smoke hemp. Um, and, but yeah, but so hemp, it's, it's one of the groups within cannabis. Now that is different from the legal definition of hemp. The legal definition here in Colorado, they say hemp is whatever produces less than 0.3% THC. Now that is different from the biological definition, right? Because that could be marijuana, you know, with low THC. And that's different from the hemp that you use for, for clothing or for, for fiber. So how do you explain to someone the difference between the biological definition and then the legal definition? Like, why does that difference exist? That's a good question. Why does that difference exist? I think because the one that wrote that definition did not study the biology of the plant. But um, I think I think it's, it's important for laws and regulations to know, okay, this produces high THC and this produces low THC and they just needed to call it something and they just called it hemp, even though it's not, in my opinion, as a biologist, is not the adequate naming. But, um, but I think that it's a little bit problematic because I think that there is a flaw in the naming convention in cannabis we know that if you go to multiple dispensaries and you ask for a strain, let's say Girl Scout cookies, um, those different Girl Scout cookies might not be related at all, In biologically. Mm. Yeah, they might not. So, so you're getting different things. And then when they say, okay, this is sativa and this is indica, that might not be accurate either. And that 70% sativa, 30% indica, I really do not know what that means, you know, like 70, 30, like what, how, you know, how did you calculate those numbers and what, so, so really, um, I think that the naming convention is, is flawed and what I think should be done is telling people what to consume depending on the, um, what the plant produces. So, okay, you want something that has, you know, this amount of THC or this amount of CBD, and maybe if you have the, the, the relatedness, so, so if you know how the different strains are related, and then someone comes to your dispensary and says, well, I usually smoke Blue Dream for my back pain, then you can say, well, I don't have Blue Dream, but I have this other one that it's very closely related. Maybe it can be used for your back pain too. 
So instead of saying, well, I don't use Blue Dream, but I've heard that this other one, you know, Green Crack is also great for back pain. No, well, maybe you can actually use the biology um, to recommend it, especially to medical patients. So really helpful. I appreciate that explanation. We're running a, a little bit of, uh, um, out of time. So the next question, uh, you have this passion for also education. So you are a, the president of this foundation. So explain briefly uh, your role and then what's the mission of the foundation? So um, the nonprofit organization, it's called the Agricultural Genomics Foundation. And we intend to educate the public about our scientific findings. And most of what I've been doing is, is giving public talks um, here and, and in other places in the world, especially in South America. And, and yeah, so, so it's, it's trying to, to get our research out of the university and out of our building and, and give it to the public, especially because it's on cannabis and it's, you know, it's, it's a medicinal plant and, and it has all of this political implications. So we're trying to, to get our research out there and the importance to do actual good research with, with, yeah, with methods and, and explain to people what we do on our findings. So how can people um, get a hold of, of you or at least learn about the foundation? So um, the websites, our websites are agriculturalgenomics.org. Um, and uh, also my, my Twitter, I am at Canagenomics. Um, and um, yeah, we post things on Twitter and on our websites. Great, and I've learned a ton talking to you and I'm still um, amazed at how much uh, I and others don't know about the, the genome of cannabis and also the research that needs to be done. So I hope um, you come back in the future and share some more of your work, uh, but we're gonna end it here. So thank you for being on the show. Uh, you've been watching Getting High on Anthropology. Thanks for watching. You can find out about the show going to fsngreen.org. That's www.fsngreen.org and you should come down to Denver Open Media, check out the different resources and support that they have here. Denver Open Media, the mission is to ensure that you have the power in your hands to make media yourself and tell your own stories so that other people don't tell stories for you. Uh, there's great courses here. There's everything from uh, video editing, uh, studio production, field production. So come on down, check out Denver Open Media and uh, hope you enjoy the show and thank you and have a good night. Mm -hmm.